Did podcast. Hi there, how are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did podcast. This week I have an interview with Ari Paul from Block Tower Capital, somebody who I've been trying to get on the podcast for quite some time and he does not disappoint. But before I discuss the show, I would like to give you a message from the sponsor. Crypto investors in the US, I want to introduce you to Equity Trust. They can educate you on the possibilities of protecting your profits as it is possible to mitigate taxes by investing in cryptocurrency with your IRA. With a self-directed IRA, you can invest in Bitcoin and other crypto in a potentially tax-deferred or tax-free way. If this sounds interesting to you, then you can discover more by visiting trustetc.com slash crypto. They have a free guide which will explain the potential benefits and possibilities for you to invest in a tax-advantaged environment get your guide now at trustetc.com slash crypto so i've wanted to have ari on the show for quite a while i've listened to a number of his other interviews the one he did recently with luke martin and uh, previously with laura shin and i really appreciate the way he approaches things i love his perspective and he definitely makes me think about things in ways that i've not done before and he does this also in my interview which is great and as this crypto bear market drags on the lens is firmly on the whole sector and while i have become a bit more comfortable recently with bitcoin of sound money and the work I've been doing, improving my knowledge there, I do have many questions around altcoins and token projects. So the bar is high now. <laughs> Too many projects have, have failed to deliver or deliver uh, deliver things with low usage numbers. I think Org is a good example recently. Um, outside exchanges, I don't think we're yet to see any kind of killer app. So yes, the bar is high. But with this interview, I specifically wanted to ask Ari about this. I wanted to ask where value lies. I wanted to ask his view on the various thesis around uh, altcoin and tokens projects and what are the valid tests. And specifically from my side, I'm really interested in product market fit coming from a UX background. And I think this is something severely lacking with a crypto. So that was another thing I wanted to talk to Ari about. But yes, he doesn't disappoint. Uh, it's a great interview. And I'm really glad that he came on the show. So please do support the show. Please do leave me a review on iTunes if you think I deserve five star. Obviously, I really appreciate that. Follow me on social media. I'm on Medium, Twitter, Instagram. My handle on everything is at what Bitcoin did. You can check out my website, which is www.whatbitcoindid.com, although I do need to do a lot of work with it. A lot of the things I've written in the past, uh, I no longer believe in or agree with. And so I need to go through and edit some of that. But please do check it out. And also, please do share the show out with your friends and family. It really does help. Okay, so on to the interview. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. If you do have any questions, do feel free to reach out to me. I pretty much reply to everyone. Uh, my email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. And yeah, just feel free to shoot something over. Good morning, Ari. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm pretty good, thanks. Uh, thank you for agreeing to do this. I've been keen to interview you for a while. I'm not going to go into your origin story. You've done enough previous podcasts, but it would be really good if you could just, for my audience, let them know who you are, who you work for, and what, what you do. Sure. I'm a founder and CIO of Block Tower Capital, and we're crypto investors. In preparing for the interview, I went through a bunch of your previous tweets and content, and one of the most interesting things I found was a, a quote from you where you said, we should change our minds very quickly when appropriate. And I felt that was a very appropriate tweet right now for the crypto space because a number of the theories which people had and hypothesis during 2017 have now been debunked or we're having to reconsider uh, with this bear market. So can you tell me where that came from for you? Sure. Um, Let's see. That tweet, uh, I, actually, I don't remember if it was in response to anything in particular. It probably was. I, I think I had a conversation with another fund manager who had just changed their mind very sharply, and I think I was maybe impressed by it. But um, I, I, I think um, I, I claim to be basically not good at anything, but there's a so- Socratic humble brag here, which is I kind of know it. So like the thing that I brag about, which is, is kind of a humble brag, is I think I'm pretty good at knowing what I don't know and at, at a adapting to new information. And that's an amazingly valuable skill that makes up for me being pretty bad at most other things. Um, and, and it's so important in cryptocurrency because there's so many unknowns. There's just so many things that are fundamental to me, at least I, I, there's people who think they know the answer. Um, but you know, so right now, uh, in 2017, we had the whole ERC 20 phenomena, which stemmed partly from the fat protocol thesis. Uh, we're probably jumping into kind of the meat of it, but, um, so like my, I, I'll dive into my view on that if you don't mind. Um, mm-hmm. so Joe Manegro of USV wrote this incredibly short, concise, articulate essay on the fat protocol thesis saying that basically value would flow down the stack to these, uh, to the protocol layer. And unlike the internet where the applications made the money, Facebook, Twitter, um, and the protocols didn't cause they were open source, SMTP, FTP, 
Tim Berners-Lee, who created World Wide Web, didn't get rich. Um, the idea was that maybe in cryptocurrency, it'll be the opposite. Maybe the application layer will provide value to the space layer, right? So that led to Ethereum becoming worth tens of billions of dollars. Um, you know, it, it led to all of these protocols that might be a new Ethereum, whether it's EOS or Zillica or Ontology, being worth, you know, 500 million, a billion dollars, which is really, I mean, these are large dollar amounts, right? This is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of that was based on, I think, this kind of fat protocol thesis, this idea that value would flow down the stack, um, facilitated by Ethereum kind of support making it very easy to, launch, to crowdfund and, and launch new projects. And now that's being questioned. So a lot of the kind of thought leaders in the space are saying, does that really make, and including by Joel Manegro, by the way. So Joel, uh, who wrote the Fat Protocol thesis, which was an extremely simple essay, and Joel has since clarified and said, I didn't mean it quite the way people are interpreting it. It was kind of a very simple model. I didn't mean it as simple as it seems, that the Fat Protocol isn't necessarily Ethereum or Bitcoin. It isn't necessarily the base layer. Um, and even so, Joel's views have kind of evolved, as have the markets. Um, so yeah, right now the whole market is questioning, do we really believe in this thesis? Um, will Ethereum necessarily benefit if you have these killer application layers on top? Um, even doing the math. So now it's gone from kind of vague philosophy to actually some math. So, for example, a friend of mine is uh, Kyle Samani, Multicoin, who wrote yep. an essay looking at Augur and Ethereum and kind of how value might work there. And also, if you have an application above Augur that is kind of a centralized repository, how might the economics be split? And similar to that protocol thesis, this is very early stage work. Kyle didn't give us answers. He gave us questions or he gave us a thing to talk about, you know, um, to me, a lot of these are still fundamentally unknown. And, and the reason they're unknown is because they involve an intersection of human behavior, uh, kind of formal game theory, and then some fundamental engineering questions. So um, what will interoperability facilitate and with how much friction and um, just how, you know, one, one thesis is realistically is an average person in 10 or 20 or 30 years going to own 3,000 tokens. Is it realistic to expect that if you want to ride Uber, you're going to have Uber coin? And, you know, today the answer is certainly no. That's high friction. No one's going to, an average person is not going to have all these different currencies. But maybe the technology will support instant transfer between currencies in a decentralized way built into the software. So maybe I won't ever know that I own an Uber coin. Maybe I'll have an app on my phone that instantly converts my Bitcoin into Uber coin, pays a driver, instantly converts it back. And maybe that'll happen with such low friction that it is possible that, that maybe we will be using 3000 currencies without even really knowing it. So these are all like really complicated, nuanced questions that are going to have a huge impact on what crypto looks like in 10 years. Yeah, that's very interesting. So I was with uh, Jamie Burke last week from Outlier, who I know you know, because you might be on a panel with him at South by Southwest. And what he said to me is that the these decentralized applications will probably be more successful once they're invisible to users. So though I think what you're saying there with regards to the tokens, the interoperability is, is probably correct. And also referencing Kyle's article, actually I read that too. The most interesting thing I found in that article is where he discussed the possibility of these projects considering recentralization. I don't know if you saw that. Yes, it's very interesting to think about and, and we have like zero data points. So there's not a single, like, like something that's worth noting is there's not a single utility token that is successful as a utility token. There's not one. There's not one that's being used at any meaningful scale, including Ethereum. Um, Ethereum is very successful as a uh, crowdfunding tool, and its value currently comes from it being used as a store of value by projects and by speculators who are betting it will become kind of a store of value or money. But we don't have, I mean, Augur had a, had a great launch. Um, it was four years in the making. It's a real use case you know, on, on some days they have less than a hundred users. So, and the valuation of Augur, you know, kind of requires there to be tens of thousands, if not millions of users, um, you know, the way it's currently valued. So, um, the idea of recentralization, what Kyle's exploring, uh, we just, to, to me, we don't know. So I love thinking about it and talking about mm. it. Um, and, and it gets increasingly complex because it's not just right now, our mental model is really simple, decentralized network or for-profit company. And there's a lot of hybrids in between that are kind of being explored that have never existed in human history. So DAOs, I think, are, are, will be a big thing eventually. You know, we, we were all scarred by the DAO fiasco with Ethereum. Um, but there's going to be tremendous innovation with all sorts of different semi-centralized models that are currently just um, kind of ideas in people's heads. So the different governance models of EOS versus Tezos versus Cosmos, um, Ethereum is even somewhere in there where you have this a little bit of a, um, you have an Ethereum foundation and while they don't directly control the network, there's certainly a key role played by Vitalik and Vlad. It's very different than the role Bitcoin Core plays in Bitcoin. These are all open experiments and there's a lot of models that no one has thought of yet. So when we think about recentralizing Augur, 
it's very hard to conceptualize because we don't know what that recentralization might look like because it, they're not necessarily going to draw on any model that has ever existed. Yeah. I actually find it interesting. You, you said uh, the successful launch of Augur, and I've followed some of your tweets in that it was obviously some of the most complex smart contracts that existed. I, I myself question whether it was a successful launch. Um, coming from a background working in uh, tech development and product market fit, I found it quite unusual that it took three years to have something out there to test and found the user experience actually very difficult. And that was one of the big problems I felt for um, for their rollout. And, and then I, th I felt like maybe the community defended them quite a bit because it's great that there's a product out there and uh, there was a lot of padding on the back. But really, actually, I, I found it, I didn't think it was a successful launch because it was so difficult to set up and use. Do you find any, any of those criticisms fair? Totally, totally. So, I, I mean, they're accurate. Certainly, they're accurate criticisms. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, if it had a user interface that was as easy to use as a typical sports betting website, you would probably have tens of thousands of users right now. Um, it's extremely difficult to use. Uh, there's a lot of blockchain engineers who just gave up on the first, especially the very first release. They then kind of made some patches to the, the front end. But um, no, so I mean, they're very valid criticisms. Um, on the tech side, I mean, it was, it, it, it's so something, so I'm not an engineer. I don't pretend to be, but talking to engineers, um, there's a misconception by, by most people in the industry about just how hard it is to get a smart contract right. Mm. So, I mean, Parity, the co-founder of Ethereum, Gavin Wood, with his own money, lost tens of millions of dollars on the simplest smart contract you can do, which is a multi-sig way of storing Ethereum. I mean, that's about as simple as you can get with a smart contract. And twice he lost tens of millions of dollars of his own money. Like he was incentivized to get it right. Um, and that's, you know, one really simple contract. Augur is, uh, I think it's something like 105 smart contracts that form its backbone. And you have this incredibly complex game theory and it's a massive honeypot for attackers. Um, so it's an immense technological challenge that a lot of, I mean, talking to the team, no one was sure if the launch would just go at all. And, and there is, I, I would say there's a very meaningful chance the entire network breaks at some point in the next year. The team acknowledges that. Um, it's so complicated. The odds of there not being any fundamental bug that destroys the network is, is frankly, probably low. Um, the plan is they'll just relaunch the network. So the entire network will break. They'll fix the bug and then it's open source. They'll release the open source and someone will relaunch it. I'm not saying that'll happen. I don't know. But but it's certainly it would be naive to not think that's likely uh, or at least you know somewhat likely. Um, so I think it was a great technological achievement in terms of the user interface. Uh, you're totally right. They just weren't that focused on it. Um, in crypto in general, until maybe six months ago, engineers generally didn't care about the user experience. There was almost a snobbery about it. It was, oh, you don't want to use a command line interface. You don't want to run your own node. You don't want to own your own private keys. Well, we don't want you. You, you have no business being in this community, right? Now what's happened is because the industry's gotten big enough, you're getting the world's best product managers, UI people, marketers getting in the game. So now you have people like Jack Dorsey of Square not only working on Bitcoin, but on Lightning Network which is pretty extraordinary, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Lightning Network is kind of the, you know, it's incredibly dense engineering, right? There aren't that many people in the world who can contribute to Lightning Network. And you now have one of the world's best product people, consumer-focused people working on that with the Lightning teams to, you know, produce an actual user experience that people can can use. Um, so I agree with the criticism. Augur was probably under-focused on the UI side of things. Um, the UI side of things is kind of everything as we look. But my view on, on the crypto world is, Two years ago, it didn't really make sense to talk about broad usage because we weren't there yet. We weren't ready. So we didn't have some of the basic th – so it didn't make sense to focus on getting Bitcoin broader usage when Bitcoin was near its capacity. Same with Ethereum. Like what's the point of bringing 10 million people onto Ethereum when Ethereum can't handle that, right? So now we have Ethereum side chains like Loom Network. We have um, – Lightning Network isn't quite there yet, but it's getting there. Um, and there's other potential technological solutions that are pretty close, things like atomic swaps, Um so, you know, we're now heading into a world where we can handle more users at a technological level. We might not quite be there yet, but but I, I think it, within a year, you're going to have some really solid um, kind of layer two solutions, sidechain type solutions. Um, so now it makes sense to really focus on UI, which is everything. Small differences in friction. Um, I mean, one, here's a really simple example. So I transfer cryptocurrency a lot. I'm copying and pasting a private key or a public key, um, I should say, for a, a, a public address. Um, it's terrifying, right? The idea of transferring large amounts of money, copying this uh, arcane string of yeah. characters and numbers. And I joke that like the day that I'm not scared doing that is like the day I'm out, like period, right? Like, yep. cause that's the day I'm gonna mess up. So fortunately I've never yet had an error with like, 
many thousands of transfers, but but the minute I'm not scared is probably the day I lose a lot of money. Um, in five years, no one's going to be pasting public keys. It's going to be some in some way abstracted. Um, it's the same with like the I've talked to some engineers who were some of the very first email users in the 70s, and they had to compile their own code, and they had to it was a command line interface to send an email. And uh, we're kind of at that stage still in crypto. It, you know, mm -hmm. copying and pasting a public key is a little bit like a command line interface in my mind. And, and eventually we will abstract beyond that. And there's a lot of work on that, right? This is, it's not, that's not even a, that's not a tech problem. That's really just people putting in, you know, people prioritizing, creating an abstraction layer. And there's a lot of people doing that now because now there's the user demand. Yeah, I can totally empathize. I bought 110 Dragon Mints last, no, early this year. I can't remember the, say it was $250,000, a single transfer. And like you, I've never had a single one go uh, 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 fail. But those about nine, ten minutes after I sent the money, just waiting for the email confirmation, it was I was just sat there sweating. And I, yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, so just a little bit more on that um, product market fit thing as well. Obviously, you're probably aware of the work by Eric Ries, the Lean Startup. Um, I'm, are you aware of the work by Ash Moira? similar no so he he has a um he has a uh, concept around something called the customer factory and what i found with crypto is that the engineering is there but there are other aspects of the product market fit aren't so we have the interface which you've discussed but we have the user acquisition and retention which also in the crypto world is uh, even more difficult because we don't have uh, often the users are anonymized and then we also have the economics so the product market fit tends to be those four spokes and i think it feels like we're only focusing on engineering now and, and the other three are missing and i feel like until there is some recognition of this kind of customer factory within crypto we're going to have these uh, screenshots from dat radar continually showing low user numbers outside of exchanges do you have any f uh, view on that yeah, totally agree. Um, so a, a big thesis of mine uh, is, as both an investor gauging an investment and also trying to be value add to projects is um, marketing is heavily undervalued. Marketing is almost a dirty word. So mm -hmm. I'm not a marketer. I'm not an advertiser. I don't really have that skill set. But I, I recognize the value um, and, and re appreciate it and recognize that there's there's a perverse element in the crypto world, which is that that we, we kind of fetishize the fact that Bitcoin basically never marketed. You, you never really had someone behind it. You never really had many people with incentives. Um, there were a couple exceptions. So people like Roger Ver actually bought advertisements for Bitcoin five years ago because he owned so much. He had an incentive to do so and believed in it. But for the most part, you haven't had much marketing for Bitcoin. Where do you get the most marketing? Generally, the scammiest projects. Right. There's an inverse relationship. Generally, the highest quality projects that are the most decentralized, the most focused on engineering, tend to have the least marketing. And so we have in our minds associated if I see if I'm on Twitter and I see banner ads for uh, an ICO, it's a good indication I shouldn't invest in it because the highest quality ICOs generally shy away from that. They, they don't need it. Uh, word of mouth gets around or, or reputation. Um, and that's just not how they think. And, and that that's a true heuristic right now, but it's led to the problem that um, good projects are very reluctant to market. So um, I, I won't name names, but I, I've sat down with a few really brilliant engineers who are leading early stage projects, and I've said, hey, I know a lot of the world's best growth hackers and marketers. You're, I think you have a great, great project here, but this is path dependent. You, the world is not going to beat a path to your doorstep. And you're working on open source code. So there's a concern that you're going to toil away in obscurity, and you've got a three-person team. If you did a little marketing, and, and marketing at its best just means communicating the value proposition of your product. It doesn't mean, like I think in crypto people are like, oh, marketing means tricking people or it means yeah. you know, selling them something they don't want or, or lying to them, right? Uh, marketing at its best is just communicating the value proposition of what you're building. And, um, and so we want the best projects to raise more money, to hire more engineers, um, to, to get to find their users, right? To find the users who are attracted. And also, of course, there's the reciprocal a lot of the engineers in the space just don't care. They don't care about product market fit. They don't care what users want. They're like, I know what I want to build. I'm going to build it. Um, so, but so I, I totally agree that um, it's it's underserved, which is which is weird. There's been a ton of aggressive marketing in the space, probably too much, too much PR, too much marketing. But it's been for bad projects, right? Generally, it's not uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, you you have projects like Tron that start off. Um, uh, plagiarizing someone else's white paper and just spend tons of money marketing and build this massive market cap and then start buying companies. Um, and Tron's probably spent more money marketing than, you know, 10 much better projects combined. Um, 
so yeah, lots of room for improvement. Something I try to actively do is I've been becoming friends with more people who are kind of growth hackers, marketers, and I'm trying to connect them to quality projects and say, you guys can help each other. And, um, and the marketers get it. The marketers are like, and, and the people I'm talking to are people who are genuine believers in the crypto value proposition. They're not just in it for the money. They, they really want to contribute and help, um, the, the vision of kind of decentralized, trustless, censorship resistant, judgment resistant money. They believe in it. Um, or for more specific applications. So I'll give you an example. Um, one project, uh, so I guess I'm, I'm not trying to shill something. I'm using this example. Mm-hmm. So disclosure, we've invested. Um, there's a project called Good Money. And Good Money is, I think of it really as a go-to-market play. So it's, it's a uh, fantastic team of serial entrepreneurs who really know what they're doing in terms of scaling an engineering team, scaling a company, uh, product market fit, consumer acquisition, um, and building something that consumers actually want. And uh, the engineering, they are innovating in engineering at the margin, but it's not really an engineering project. Um, so they're going to end up having 50 engineers probably, but um, it's, it's, this is a team that really knows how to find product market fit and, and advertise and market and create a user base. So um, yeah, I'm, I, a lot of those projects are what I'm most excited about and I actually think are the most valuable to the crypto world because at this point, we're ahead in engineering of where we are in users. Yeah. And so now it's, it's finally time to try to like, get the users. And you, you mentioned governance and models, and you're quite interested in those, and, and you see the opportunity. Um, interestingly, preparing for an, uh, an interview I, d- I did yesterday, I'd seen a quote by Nick Zabo where he said, uh, charlatans focus on governance innovations, valuable players focus on minimizing governance. And there is a, certainly a, uh, a group of people who consider gov- governance innovations of uh, just repeating the history of stupid humans and that most of these uh, technologies won't be used that much. What are your thoughts there? Uh, so first, I, I fanboy hard over Nick Zabo. He's, he's yeah. a bit of an idol of mine. He's uh, 10 times smarter than me, knows more about every aspect of crypto than I do. Um, so, And I hugely recommend that everyone read his unenumerated.blogspot.com. It's, it's brilliant. Um, there isn't that much content there, but what's there is so gold. It's reshaped the way I think about crypto. I think the way a lot of people do. His essay on social scalability, um, the way he's framed the history of money and how Bitcoin fits in is brilliant. Um, with all of that said, uh, I... I lean towards his governance minimization hypothesis. It's very reasonable to me, but I'm not sure. And so I re and I really value experimentation. I think we're, we're so nascent in this industry. There's so many unknowns that I think even bad experiments are valuable. So EOS is a radical experiment in governance. If it fails, if it fails due to poor engineering, we won't really learn much. I really, really hope that I kind of don't care if it succeeds or fails, but if it fails for governance reasons, we'll learn a lot from that. Um, and that's really, really valuable. So I don't know if Nick's right. I think for the crypto community to take a hardline stance that Nick is right and we should kind of shun anything else is is a horrible mentality to take. We should be embracing experimentation. And there's only a handful of real avenues of experimentation. So there's experimentation on consensus mechanism, which is great. So is is something other than proof of work viable? I have no idea. Maybe. Um, It would almost surprise me if the first ever consensus mechanism for cryptocurrency was the optimal one. That would be a first time in human history that the first technological attempt at something was the best. So the odds that proof of work is the best in current form, and of course proof of work can be implemented in different ways. It just seems improbable to me, but I have no idea if proof of stake works or, or DPoS or proof of capacity. And I'm sure there's a lot of consensus mechanisms that may be viable that no one's ever thought of yet. We're so early. So experimentation on consensus mechanisms, experimentation on governance, experimentation on uh, ledger architecture. So maybe blockchain's not where it's at. Maybe we want cryptocurrencies based on something that's a little bit different than a blockchain. Maybe there are other types of distributed ledgers, some of which have probably not been thought up yet, that have that share many of the similarities of a blockchain, but might just be better. Um, so those are, okay, so we got consensus governance architecture. There's really only one other prime category, which is uh, monetary schedule. Um, so if you think about like, like Bitcoin maximalists will say, if Bitcoin can do it, why should anything else exist? And interoperability means maybe you can get any feature on any blockchain on Bitcoin. The same statement is true for Ethereum, of course. So if Ethereum gains massive user effects and all that, anything you can do on EOS or Filecoin or Zcash, you'll be able to do on Ethereum because of interoperability. I'm oversimplifying a little bit, but that's probably generally true technologically. Um, so one of the things, the only other thing that can't converge the only other feature that you can't just borrow from another chain is the monetary system. So Bitcoin is deflationary over time. Uh, Ethereum is currently a question mark. Let's say we want money to have 10% annual inflation. That would have to be a separate 
system. It would have to be a separate cryptocurrency. You couldn't have Bitcoin both be deflationary and inflationary as one coin. So all of those, those are kind of the four elements where you can have true differentiation. And my, my guess is you're not going to have leading large protocols that are not differentiated all, along at least one of those axes. So you're unlikely to have, um, for example, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash are very unlikely to coexist indefinitely. They might coexist for five years, but they're not differentiated enough along those angles. Um, similarly, you're, you're just not going to have 30 giant blockchains. And you're going to need differentiation along those angles. And I, and I, at this early stage, I think we should be experimenting along all four of those axes. Right. Okay. It's quite interesting you talk then about Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash because I'm halfway through Safety and Amoose's The Bitcoin Standard. I assume you've had a look. I assume you've read. I, I, I'm familiar with Safety and's uh, articles and thoughts. I haven't read the book. So, it, it, so I'm, I'm from an advertising background. So I, you know, I don't have an economics background, but it was very interesting to read the uh, comparisons between gold and silver and uh, the sound money thesis that in the end one will win, and it feels like um, uh, Bitcoin should win. And it was also then interesting to read where you, following up the Fat Protocol thesis, talked around the. It was the fat security. No, remind me what you said. Some, it was the secure. Uh, most, I've got it here. I, I, don't even, I, I wasn't trying to coin a term. I think I called it um, the secure protocol thesis, but I yeah. wasn't trying to like, like, I wasn't trying to invent a term or anything. And it really wasn't, I, I was really more uh, tweaking the fat protocol thesis. I wasn't adding anything that new. The main idea was just the key feature that I think will determine the winner of global store of value, which I think will be the most valuable use case, I think comes down to security because security is almost the only thing that you can't add on, borrow, like Z, like Ethereum can add IPFS or something mm -hmm. like it. They can add Swarm. Uh, ZK Snarks, which are Zcash's kind of claim to fame currently, Ethereum is adding it. So these are all features that can simply be integrated. A lot of those same things will be able to be integrated into Bitcoin as a layer two or as a side chain. And so you, you'll be able to get, I think, any feature you want in any chain. Um, so features will not be differentiating. So what will determine the winner? Well, you can't leapfrog security. So if Bitcoin has the equivalent of uh, requires $30 billion to attack due to hash power, if I create a new chain that's incrementally better than Bitcoin or is a feature Bitcoin doesn't have, um, it's still very hard for me to get past that moat. Mm -hmm. But that's very interesting because when you mentioned previously about um, proof of work being the first technology uh, in the history to have worked first time, maybe it's not just because of the technology itself. Maybe if it had started out as proof of stake, it's still would have worked because of the fact the security uh, element and the fact that it's so hard to hack now. That, that's, they were the two comparisons I found interesting. So um, I'm also conscious of time. There's a few things I want to get through with you. I want to talk about your predictions because your 2018 predictions were very interesting. And um, rather than go through them all, are there any specific ones that stood out to you? Because you did a recent review where you talked, to, you kind of reviewed them. So, for example, your prediction of we will see six and 60 k Great traders are right 55 to 60 percent of the time. So anyone who tells you that they know the future is just lying or, or stupid. Um, so I admit my mistakes. I'm wrong pretty frequently. Um, I, I, I'll explain why I was wrong or, or what. Uh, so someone responded to a comment of mine saying, hey, Ari, a year ago you told us institutional money would be in by now. And I said, you're right. I was wrong. I thought it would be in faster. Um, here are the remaining obstacles. I thought custody would be solved a little bit faster than it was. I thought we'd have better trading infrastructure. I thought, you know, so, yeah, I was wrong. I, I, what, what I thought would happen in 12 months is probably more like 24. And here's why I was wrong. Right. Um, so I'm very ready to admit when I'm wrong. Um, I, I assume some of these are just my mistakes or my ignorance. Some of them are genuine unknowns where we're guessing, you know, we're taking educated guesses and there's no way to be consistently right. Because so, for example, if someone tells me that they can tell me today what consensus mechanism will be viewed as best in 20 years, I, I would argue it's impossible because there are going to be new things invented. There's no way you can foresee. Right. They're unknown unknowns. Um, it doesn't mean we shouldn't guess, though. As investors, we have to take a guess. But um, so I don't beat myself up over, for being wrong. You need a, an opinion on some things. Um, so. Yeah, so the six and sixty k was funny because almost immediately after I wrote that, yeah. it plummeted from like seventeen thousand to six k, <laughs> which um, I certainly considered, but I didn't. I, I I didn't predict what my when I said six and sixty k. What I meant what I meant to indicate was I expect Bitcoin to be very volatile in both directions, and 
the extremes that it can reach uh, basically open your mind and recognize that we could have really extreme moves. So people tend to anchor. So Bitcoin in 2017 went from around $1,000 to $19,000. The idea that Bitcoin, if you told most people when it was at 19 that Bitcoin could fall to 3000 that's less than a giving back a year of gains. That's where it was only in September. In, in mid-September, Bitcoin was at 3,000, and yet it seemed impossible. So part of the point of that tweet was just, nothing's impossible, this is hyper-volatile, you should expect extreme moves in both directions. Um, and I did genuinely think at that time that we would see both substantially below and substantially above, but those specific numbers were kind of random. I, I wasn't anchoring. So we got to 6,000, and then people said, oh, well, this means you're probably gonna be right about the next call, right? And I said, no, the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you get new information, you adjust, right? So, so okay, we hit 6,000, 60,000 is now much less likely, right? Yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I guess I pat myself on the back for just realize, for appreciating the obvious, which is Bitcoin is extremely volatile. That's it. <laughs> um, the other predictions, so one thing I said was that working oracles would be a huge theme for 2018. I think I was wrong. Um, I didn't, when I tweeted that, it's funny, I tweeted that and then I, and the people, a couple of people pinged me about what oracles are my favorite. And I realized, wow, I don't know anywhere near as much about oracles as I should. So immediately after that tweet, I spent six weeks doing a fairly deep dive into oracles and realized this is really hard technology. It's really hard game theory. It's going to take time for user acquisition and trust. And I, I think it's more like a 2019 thing or maybe even later, but like, you know, I kind of realized this is the state that things are. I mean, you have something like Chainlink, which is a great project, great team. They don't have a clear, it's a little bit of a solution in search of a problem. Um, they're, they're, or let me rephrase it a little differently. So um, th there's two basic Oracle models. One is the Augur model, which is kind of one-off discretionary bets. And the other is systematic, uh, where you have, you're not, you don't have um, game theory protecting an individual outcome. You have game theory protecting a data feed. So the idea of Chainlink and, and an Oracles that are based on data feed is we're going to connect to a data source that might be sending us thousands of data points a minute. So we'll connect to, for example, the NYSE stock exchange, and we'll get every stock price every minute or every second. Um, we're not trying to gauge whether every individual price is accurate, which is what Augur is doing. Augur is kind of creating a market around every individual data point. With Chainlink, it's um, we want to judge, is this data source viable? And we want a game three system around that. The problem right now is um, implementing Chainlink at scale requires this whole infrastructure of validators and, um, and it requires demand uh, people who actually want NYSE data but don't trust the NYSE, which is a pretty small sliver of people right now. It requires onboarding those data providers. It requires creating this infrastructure to support the game theory. It's a lot. And bootstrapping that is very tough because until there's demand, there's no supply. Until there's supply, there's no demand. Until both of those exist, no one wants to serve as a validator because why would you? There's no money in it. So bootstrapping that takes a lot of time. Um, so Chainlink, that kind of use case, I, I realize is probably not meaningful in 2018, maybe not even in 2019. And that's not a that's not a comment on the project or valuation or anything. That's just are there going to be major users? Are there going to be tens of thousands of users of Chainlink in the next six months? I don't think so. Augur, uh, I just realized, wow, this is so hard to implement correctly from a tech perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, I and one of the reasons I think they weren't more focused on the UI was it took them four years to have a little bit of confidence in the smart contracts and the game theory. Like they're a team of 30 people working hard. They're smart people. They're passionate people. It's not like they were sitting on their butts. No, of course. It was like four years. They think they may have gotten something that won't collapse on day one. <laughs> so, you know, I think that, that they weren't more focused on the UI because it's like we're not we're not even there yet. You yeah. Know? OK, that's fair enough. I think it sounds like most of the things that people are expecting, the things holding back is just infrastructure. The infrastructure on every level, whether it's institutional money or custody or oracles, it's the infrastructure has just taken a lot longer than people expect. And the the institutional side of things really interesting. I watched your interview with um, Luke Martin. Um, he was actually my first ever guest. I don't know if you know that. Uh, great guy. Um, and you talked about institutional investment. And there, I, th I think the, this, one of the sad things about crypto is most people behind this great technology just want everything to go up and make money so they're pegging themselves with this hope of institutional money what what are the myths the myths around institutional money that you can clear up for people oh that's an interesting phrasing the myths um because hmm. okay so put, from my perspective i don't see there as a a day one where suddenly institutional money comes in. I, I expect it's just a, a scale. And over time, there's high-risk institutional money and low-risk institutional money. And just, there's just going to be different trigger points for different people. I agree with that. Um, 
so yeah, people almost always, we tend to think of things in false binaries. We tend to think of things as like, is institutional money coming in? Yes or no. And, and things are almost always a spectrum. With that said, there is this FOMO element that applies even to institutions and smart money. Right. And the market, the market, meaning traders and, and uh, retail, everyone tries to front run what they think is going to happen. So there is an element that we don't need all institutional money to be in. If we know, like, for example, if an ETF was approved, but it wouldn't launch for six months, the market would immediately try to price that in, right? Bitcoin would rally on the announcement intelligently because they'd say, okay, well, it might take six months for this to have any impact on institutional flows, but we want to position ahead of that. And we want to position ahead of the, and we're not going to buy one day before the ETF launches because other traders will beat us to the punch. So the market starts pricing stuff in. So one of the reasons we have the bear market we have now is people got really bullish saying the CME, CME and CBOE futures would help usher in major inflows. Um, I was guilty of that, too. I actually thought the futures would produce meaningful net inflows. Um, and it, it, it has at the margin, but much, much, much less than a lot of people thought, myself included. And so a lot of traders bought Crypt Bitcoin into that and then were disappointed. So the, CM, the futures launch was almost the high in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. It was off by maybe like 10 days. Yep. Um, and that was because traders tried to kind of front run the, that institutional money. And then, wow, okay, we, we, we bought billions of dollars of Bitcoin ahead of this and there's only 100 million in inflows. And so the traders then have to sell out because they were wrong. Um, so I, I don't know if it's like misconceptions. I think it's more people just kind of don't know who the players are. So like to really quickly kind of lay it out, um, I'm most familiar with the US aspect, but somewhat familiar with the world. So, uh, the, the, the way I think of like the, the whole timeline of, of crypto money was first you had the anarchists, the libertarians, the cypherpunks, the engineers who were the, the crowd supporting Bitcoin in the first two years. Um, then you had a little bit more mainstream engineers and cryptographers and, and libertarians who were excited about it. Then you had the um, uh, techno utopians who got excited about Ethereum. Very, very different type of person, very different mentality. So Bitcoin was going to undermine central banks and maybe take down governments. Ethereum was going to be the next internet or Facebook 3.0 or right. It was a very different kind of, um, and, and, and the people investing in Ethereum were people who like the idea of a Zuckerberg or Peter Thiel at the head of a company. They like the idea of a benevolent dictator who can innovate quickly and lead and, and, um, add features. Um, then you, now I think we're in what I, what I kind of call the wall street phase, which uh, is not a great term, but we are seeing massive interest and, um, infrastructure building, by Wall Street. So the money isn't moving, but the people are. So uh, whether it's Goldman Sachs trading desk or the recent backed announcement of Northern Trust and a bunch of other Wall Street institutions that are building infrastructure. Um, I was on a, pan a crypto panel uh, a couple weeks ago with a representative from State Street. And State Street was very honest saying, we're not going to custody this for probably three years. But the fact that State Street would have a representative on a crypto panel just shows State Street has actively is actively analyzing and thinking about it. And in, in that same panel, um, it was a crowd of only financial professionals. And the moderator first said, how many people in the room do your institutions do anything with crypto beyond evaluating it? And, and it was like no one. And then it was how many of you own cryptocurrency? And it was 90 percent of hands went up one year ago. It would have been 10 percent of hands that went up. So a lot of these individuals at Fidelity and State Street and Goldman and Barclays, um, a lot of the individuals are involved. The organizations are building infrastructure. They're looking at it. Every Wall Street bank now does sell side research on crypto. Um, so Wall Street is in the game. They're building the infrastructure that will facilitate the money flows, which are just taking a little bit longer than everyone kind of wanted. Um, the major obstacles right now, uh, I'll, I'll be really quick on this because I harp on this all the time. So custody, the fact that at the moment there is no good third party custody solution. Um, there's a lot of I think that'll be solved by your end. So you have a lot of people like Coinbase and DACC and Anchor and uh, Kingdom Trust and a lot of players. I don't know who's going to end up being the best in the lead. I'm not recommending anyone, but I think someone will probably solve it by your end in a reasonably credible way. Fidelity is talking about doing Bitcoin custody by your end. Um, trading infrastructure. Uh, right now, liquidity is fragmented across 50 exchanges globally. Connecting to those exchanges is really tough. They each have their own weird API connection. Onboarding to those exchanges is tough. It's scary being on them. They're all fly by, not all, many of them. Um, the, the CEO of one of the biggest exchanges in the world recently joked, someone threatened to sue him because they said, you stole my money. And he said, go ahead, sue me in the Seychelles, which is where they're, I guess, legally um, uh, sure, incorporated. His point, his point was, you can't sue us. Yeah. So I can screw you and you have no recourse. Mm -hmm. Well, that's terrifying. If you're a hedge fund or a pension or an endowment or a family office, the idea that you can put your money on exchange, the exchange operator can steal it and you have no recourse because the guy sitting in Estonia or the Seychelles or Malta or wherever is very, very scary. Um, a lot of these things I think are going to be solved over the next year. 
so the institutional flows, endowments have finally started getting in in the U.S. They wrote some checks to some of the big VC launches. So, for example, Andreessen Horowitz launched a crypto VC fund that is um, a spinoff. Mm -hmm. That got the first, I think it was the yep. first endowment checks. Endowments tend to be pretty slow moving, pretty conservative. Um, I think, I think there have been a couple other funds that may have gotten uh, endowment checks since. U.S. pensions are the slowest moving entities in the world, so they're not going to do anything for at least a year or two. Uh, and when I say that, I mean maybe someone will write a $10 million check. But CalPERS, some of these pension funds control tens of billions or hundreds of billions of dollars. So if one big pension fund put 1% of its money in Bitcoin, that could double the price of Bitcoin. It's not going to happen in the next year. Um, they're just so slow moving conservative. But big family offices that control uh, well in trillions of dollars globally, these are these are pools of capital mostly by people like the Walmart family, um, the Gates family, as well as smaller, just very high net worth individuals who kind of pool their capital and have it professionally managed. Huge pool of capital. They fall somewhere between an endowment and you and I, which is to say they're they're faster moving than the endowment. They're slower moving than uh, an individual. That's the current wave getting in, I think. So they're writing checks. They're kind of getting in. Um, sovereign wealth funds are getting in and interested. Um, you, you've had small flows there. Okay. Um, so have you taken much of a look at the Bitmain IPO? A little bit. I've, I've seen the offering documents. We talked about it internally. Um, I, I haven't done diligence on it. I haven't visited Bitmain's facilities. We haven't, you know, kind of dived underneath the covers. Um, the market narrative, the smart people I talk to are very mixed. So there's some people who say um, the, the way it's working, by the way, right now is there's a there's a pre IPO sale that may have just finished or may still be going on where you had individuals who were kind of friends of Bitmain, helpful to Bitmain, who got the mandate that we will give you an allocation. You can then create a fund vehicle and you can charge people money. So people were if you wanted to invest in the pre IPO and you wanted to do it for less than like 50 million dollars, you had to go through an intermediary mm -hmm. and the intermediary would charge you fees. Um, I know some very smart investors who said, I'm really happy to pay those fees. This is like uh, getting into Facebook in kind of um, pre IPO. Uh, these are world beaters. They're you know, they have a pseudo monopoly. This is exactly the kind of thing you want to invest in. And they think if the IPO is successful, the current investors in the pre IPO will something like two and a half X their money okay. very quickly. So it looks like a great deal. The counter argument is. Um, Bitmain is really a crypto company, a Bitcoin company, that they're advertising themselves as expanding into AI, which they certainly are, but which they have no, tra no meaningful traction in yet. That with Bitcoin price where it is today, Bitmain as a company is basically marginally profitable. So the headline cash flow numbers, this idea that Bitmain is this money printing machine, was possibly just a product of the bubble last year. So how profitable is Bitmain really with crypto where it is today? Um, it's very hard to do the math because they're, they're basically the accounting is not that clear. They're not doing anything wrong. It's just the accounting makes it hard to back out the math. Um, there's a lot of different business lines Bitmain has. So the problem is if you're betting on Bitmain as a bet on crypto, well, kind of, well, if, in other words, if Bitmain to be worth the 40 billion they want to IPO at, which is based on kind of last year's numbers, if that requires Bitcoin back at 20,000, well, why not just buy Bitcoin at 6,000? And if Bitcoin gets to 20,000, you'll three extra money. So um, there's some, I think, legitimate skepticism about the Bitmain business model and how dependent is it on the spread between basically the mining profitability. So with Bitcoin at 19,000, miners were making $14,000 a coin. Now miners are making $1,000 a coin. So obviously demand for, for mining equipment is going to be much, much, much reduced. And Bitmain's own mining profitability is going to be a fraction, tiny fraction of what it was last and year. And there's also the risk of the, um, the they've liquidated uh, a large part of their BTC holdings and now hold a very large uh, Bitcoin cash um, uh, uh, holding, uh, which is quite an illiquid uh, holding as well. And the view is that if they try to sell any of that, they would crash the market, whereas their BTC holding, they can. Have you looked into that at all? Yeah, I, I don't. I think it's exaggerated. Um, okay. I mean, the facts are true. I, I don't think it has that. I don't think it's that big of a deal. So okay. for Bitmain's valuation, it's not that much money. So the last quote I saw was something was half a billion dollars of Bitcoin cash. Mm -hmm. Well, Bitmain is raising at a 15 billion valuation right now. Right. Okay. So if that goes to zero, maybe they should be raising at a 14.5 billion valuation. In other words, it, it's not that relevant to Bitmain's valuation. Um, it's, I think, only relevant to Bitcoin cash 
if Bitmain, so if Bitmain dumped it in a week, it would crash the price of Bitcoin cash, no question. Mm -hmm. If they sold out of it over a year, in other words, like their stake is large, certainly very large, but it's not, it's not that large that it's, I mean, they're people, they're individuals who own more Ethereum as a percentage. Um, and certainly in most other coins, they're individuals who own way, 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 way more. So co the ownership of Bitcoin cash is concentrated, but not out of the ordinary in the crypto world. Right. Um, I think the bigger issue, uh, if, if someone is, is owns Bitcoin Cash today, I do think it's mostly a bet on Bitmain, which is not whether they'll dump it or not, but it's whether they'll continue supporting it. Mm -hmm. If Bitmain announces to the world, we've abandoned Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Cash is probably really in trouble as an asset. Right. Okay. Interesting, because obviously there's a lot of chatter on Twitter about it, but probably from people who don't understand how to value the business maybe in a way that you do. So that's quite interesting to hear. Okay. Just before we close up, um, I think it'd be great to know what are the things you're most excited about over the next year to two years and um, um, kind of what's coming up for you personally? Uh, so I, I think there's two use cases that the world is finally ready for, for a long time three axes. So until basically crypto is not used for anything a year ago, a year and a half ago, crypto wasn't used for anything um, except a little bit of dark net purchases and a little bit of store value um, and spec and a little bit of speculation. Then you had Ethereum, which made crypto used for crowdfunding in a huge way, in such a large way that it actually outpaced traditional VC seed stage investing. Then you had um, those are still kind of the only use cases. So you're not really seeing retail purchases with crypto. Um, it's mostly a casino. So you even have, it's in fact, some of the most valuable cryptocurrencies like the Binance coin are a token for speculation, <laughs> right? So so uh, people who some, some half joke, but it's somewhat real. Currently, the killer app for cryptocurrency is speculation um, or crowdfunding. Those are kind of the two things. To a much lesser degree, darknet purchases and maybe evading capital controls or if you're Venezuelan, uh, using it because your fiat has lost value. But those are, frankly, a tiny, tiny portion of all usage right now. And that was because, one, you didn't have the technology. So Bitcoin could only support seven transactions per second. Ethereum a year ago hit its capacity. Um, I mean, when, when there was the status ICO a year ago and Ethereum kind of as a network grind to a halt because it literally was over capacity just on a simple ICO. CryptoKitties took up a quarter of Ethereum capacity. So we didn't really have the tech to support more complex use cases. Smart contracts, they've existed for a while, but it's so hard to implement complex logic in a smart contract in a bug-free way. It takes a lot of time and we're building up the developer toolkits, we're building up the libraries. So I'm very optimistic, but it just takes time. So finally, we're ready for two use cases, I think. One is the initial vision of Satoshi with P2P cash. So the Bitcoin white paper was electronic peer-to-peer -peer cash. Um, it's not used for that. No cryptocurrency is really used for that. Why? Because one, the transaction limit to um, uh, the UI or, or product market fit, kind of kind of creating a feature set that is uh, you know attractive to users. Three is it takes time to acquire users. It took email. Like I have no desire to use email if none of my friends do. So it just you have to bootstrap network effects. We're finally ready where I think we're going to see projects that integrate cryptocurrency natively, similar to a pay Venmo or PayPal. We're seeing that with some projects like um, you have the, the, the Brave browser. Um, you have, uh, I mean, there's a lot of wallet type projects, right? I think, we're, but none of them are successful yet. None of them are uh, even, so Brave Browser has some users, almost none of them actually use cryptocurrency with the browser. Um, and when I say almost none, I mean, it might be thousands, but it's not tens of millions. It's a trivial rounding error for the US population, right? We're finally ready where I think over the next year, we're going to see remittances and Venmo-like peer-to-peer cash getting used with cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. Maybe micropayments towards the end of next year, uh, micropayments within a browser, something like, a, I don't know if it's Brave that wins or if Google does it, but finally starting to see micropayments built into software, which is I think hugely revolutionary. It's not about you being able to buy a New York Times article for five cents. It's about programs being able to pay programs programmatically without having to go through ACH or, or wire or third party. So if I as a programmer can dynamically purchase file storage space from a decentralized file storage server within the program itself with no intermediaries, that's huge. Like, I, it's hard to imagine kind of what what uh, innovations come from that. And then the second is uh, games. So um, I've noticed you tweet about that a few times about gaming. Yeah. So Chris Dixon has an essay from like maybe 15 years ago uh, that something like innovation starts as toys. I think if you Google search like Chris Dixon toys essay, it'll okay. probably come. It's, a, it's, it's like a one page essay. And it's and he wrote it during the last tech boom. And it's great. And he just says the world changing tech innovations usually start off looking like toys. So, you know, a lot of people like Paul Krugman famously said in the early 90s about the Internet that, hey, this is pornography and cats. No serious person cares about the Internet. And uh, we kind of now realize how silly that was. And similarly, um, you know, things like Facebook or Friendster were viewed as 
you know, for kids. And now we recognize that social media is, um, you know, we've LinkedIn as an adult version, right? Like these are, these are some of the biggest companies in the world. These are some of the biggest productivity drivers in the world. And they started off looking like playthings for college kids. So I think the same pattern is very likely to repeat in cryptocurrency, which is the first killer apps and broad, broad use cases are going to look trivial. And one of those trivial, trivial things is going to be games. Um, it's very so some of the most popular games in the world are very simple, like a Pokemon type game. The tech now exists to support it. So side chains on Ethereum can support the necessary throughput to support a Pokemon type game. Wasn't true a year ago. Couldn't do it a year ago. Um, the marketers who know how to gamify a game and market a game are now interested. They weren't a year ago. Um, so I think finally the, everything exists for a good game developer to build a viral, simple game. The tech exists to support it on Ethereum sidechain. You can track the right marketers to create a, uh, t you know, to test product market fit, to create an actual game people like using. You can add the gamification elements to monetize it, and you can actually market it and produce virality. Um, we're s I don't know if a game yet exists that has the UI. So the goal here is in the iPhone app store, I should be able to download a game. I should have no idea it's a blockchain-based crypto game. And then I should have the option, similar to most of the, the, the best games in the world today, most valuable games, they're free games that then have a payment option. And you make in-game purchases. And people spend insane amounts of money. Yep. So I think the first killer app crypto game will be identical. People won't know it's a crypto game. At some point, you hit level three, and they give you the option. And they say, hey, guys, here's a little pop-up. If you care, only if you care – you can, you know, this is how you involve crypto in this and how you can make in-game purchases and all that. And, and we'll airdrop you $50 worth of or $10 worth of uh, crypto tokens that you could sell on Binance or you can use in-game. Um, and the point is it'll go viral because it's a good game and because it's easy and it's a great UI. And then it'll be a bit of a Trojan horse. And why does the crypto benefit? Well, if you have non-fungible collectibles, there are people who've spent a million dollars in-game purchases for Game of War and for Fortnite. A million dollars. It's insane, right? And those people, at some point, if the game becomes obsolete, their item's gone. If the company goes bankrupt, the item's gone. If the company decides to ban them, censor them, or confiscate the item, the item's gone. Um, you know, that's pretty scary if you're, if you're investing huge amounts of money. So imagine if I was playing World of Warcraft or Diablo or, or Fortnite, and I could at least reasonably hope that even if that game becomes obsolete, I'll be able to transfer some element of my investment into the next Blizzard game, the next Steam game, the next whatever. Or if multiple games work together to allow for kind of the transfer of some items between games or some characters, I'm probably willing to pay a lot more for that in-game item. Mm -hmm. So maybe I was willing to pay $10 for World of Warcraft armor. Maybe in this, maybe in the crypto version, I'm willing to pay 50 bucks or 100 bucks. So from an economic modeling perspective, we don't know. There's no, I can't prove this. There's no um, successful data point. But if, if I'm pitching a crypto game project to a traditional VC and they're trying to value it, what I would say is start with the way you would normally value a traditional game. But there's a reasonable argument to be made that the monetization per user could be substantially higher. Right. Because you're, off, you're offering more value to users. Of course. Of course. I, it's kind of a strange world to imagine that where you would be buying uh, – an in-game item and, and then be using it in a, a future game. It's, it's kind of, that's kind of interesting and cool. And, and then I guess uh, when I first struggled to look at things like, I don't know, um, artwork on the blockchain, but in future, future games like Sims versions of games, you could, you could, I guess, port these between the games. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, it, it's really up to what the game developers choose to do. Interesting. Okay, great. Well, look, Ari, this has been great. Uh, uh, great to finally catch up with you. I was pretty nervous about this one, actually. Oh. I, I usually don't. But um, um, could you just uh, tell people how to uh, keep in touch with you and, um, how, and who you'd like to hear from and how? Oh, uh, it's a little bit tough. I guess, uh, tw uh, frankly, Twitter is probably the best. I, I'm actually not sure my Twitter handle. I think it's at Ari David Paul. Um, okay. Well, I'll share it in the show notes. Sure, sure. Yeah, at Ari David Paul is probably... Uh, probably best and i'm going to share out your guide to meditation oh that's ah uh, that's so amateurish I, I i would that that would be like weird and embarrassed like that was i i only did that because someone lit like asked me to on twitter because i'm not an I, that's we i'm not putting myself forward as a meditation guru at all <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you know it's actually it, it actually it's very helpful if, if you if you don't have any knowledge of meditation and you want a little soft intro actually i thought it was pretty good if you enjoyed it feel free to share it brilliant uh, but thank you for coming on i've really enjoyed this uh, me too thank you so much for having me okay what well, did you make of that did you enjoy that as much as i did 
Did you enjoy what Ari has to say? I think he really does bring uh, a good perspective to it. I think a good example of that was with Bitmain, um, with the IPO coming. A lot of people have questioned the amount of BCH they hold and, and the risk that puts. But actually, from uh, the way Ari explained it, in, in that that should change the uh, raise valuation from $15 billion to $14.5 billion, it made me think about it in a different way. And uh, yeah, I just really appreciate the way Ari looks at things and, and uh, the way he considers projects and the way he thinks everything should be a valid test and we can learn from mistakes. So I think that's great and I was really pleased to have him on the show. Please do support the show though. Please do leave me a review on iTunes. Feel free to follow me on social media. As I've said in the intro, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Medium, I'm on Steemit, I'm on Instagram, I'm at what Bitcoin did on everything and you can feel free to reach out to me. I'm pretty sure I'll get back to you. Please do share out the show with your friends and family and if you want to get in touch, please do feel free to email me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com and I will pretty much reply to everyone. I do have a couple of other call interviews coming up and I'll look forward to getting those out to you in the next couple of weeks. Okay, have a great week. 